and thank you for listening to the History of World War II podcast, episode 378, West Africa and Charles de Gaulle. Before we get into Operation Pedestal, which will leave Malta barely hanging on, we have to catch up with events in Africa. The North African campaign has been told through Operation Crusader, which was in December of 1941. But West Africa has been neglected. Thus, we will cover de Gaulle's work in West Africa, and then cover North Africa for the first half of 1942, and then onto pedestal. Why? To clear the way for the return to the Eastern Front. On with the story. When war came, as Poland was invaded, the British and French worked out pretty quickly amongst themselves that while the British vessels would handle the German warships in the Atlantic and North Sea, the French fleet would counter the Italian fleet in the Mediterranean. But six weeks after Germany invaded the West, France was out of the war. But what about her powerful fleet? That was a question that had to be addressed. But another important question was, how would the various parts of the French Empire fall to Vichy or the Free French, represented by General Charles de Gaulle. For example, some colonies, like Cameroon and French Equatorial Africa, went to de Gaulle, while the North African colonies, i.e. Algeria, Morocco, and Tunisia, went to Vichy. But what would dictate de Gaulle's next move was that the French West African countries, Mauritania, Senegal, French Sudan, French Guiana, Ivory Coast, Upper Volta, and Niger went with Vichy, so they would be the first to fall to the new French order. As for the question of the French fleet, that issue was settled on July 3rd, 1940, as the British fleet attacked and weakened their French counterparts in the Battle of Mers el Kabir at Oran in North Africa, just east of the Strait of Gibraltar. Through a combination of ego, nationalism, and real-world needs, de Gaulle, the leader of the Free French, believed he could get the French troops in Dakar, the capital of Senegal, in West Africa, just below Mauritania, to come to his side. And if this could be done, it would be a big feather in de Gaulle's cap. There would be perceived political gain, i.e. momentum, for the other colonies to join him without fighting. But there was also the gold reserves, not only of the Bank of France, but the Polish government in exile as well. A boost in the arm for sure, for wars always cost more than one thinks. Besides, the Allies needed another port city in this general area, as they currently only had one, that being at Freetown in British Sierra Leone, just above Liberia. Also having an aggressive personality, Churchill approved of the attack, thus the carrier HMS Ark Royal would participate, along with the battleships HMS Resolution and HMS Barnum, with five cruisers, ten destroyers, and enough transports for 8,000 soldiers, a mix of Royal Marines and the French Foreign Legion. The idea was simple. Ask the governor there to join them or face them in battle. Be that as it may, the forces at Dakar were considerable, what with the battleship Richelieu, two cruisers, and three destroyers. Now, the Richelieu could not move under its own power, having mixed it up with an aircraft from the HMS Hermes, another British carrier. But the battleship's guns were working just fine, which made de Gaulle nervous. But not as nervous as the soldiers and sailors who were about to rush towards that floating gun platform. But if de Gaulle thought that French nationalism, or his own magnetism, would blind the Vichy forces, he was much mistaken. First, on September 23, 1940, propaganda notes were dropped over Dakar. There was no rush to surrender. Next, planes from the Ark Royal deposited three French officers at the local airport. They were placed under arrest. Worse, one of the now captives had a list of free French sympathizers who were quickly rounded up. Again, a master class of how not to win a city over, nor count too much on the cult of personality. Not giving up on peace, an admirable idea, de Gaulle sent in a boat with more of his representatives, 
but this quickly came under fire. This was followed hard upon by Richelieu's AA guns firing on a British plane. Clearly, the answer was no. Really, no. And so by 10 a.m., the situation changed, as it was now the Allies firing on French ships. At that time, several French vessels tried to leave port, hoping they would be allowed to pass. But the Australian heavy cruiser HMAS Australia let off a few of its own warning shots. The French ships turned around, but the coastal batteries that they controlled got involved and fired at the Australia. This brought on a general engagement, several hours long, between the Allied fleet and the shore batteries. That afternoon, the Australia hit the Vichy destroyer Ludasu, who was forced to beach. With the preliminaries over, de Gaulle tried to land some of his free French troops to the southeast of Dakar. But between the heavy fog and the heavy fire from the beach, de Gaulle updated his orders to about face. De Gaulle was down, but he was not out. He probably guessed that if the defenders had fewer ships and coastal guns, they may give in. So he had six British Blackburn Suas attack the Richelieu, but little came of it. The same thing happened with an air attack against the coastal batteries. De Gaulle then sent up six swordfish to hit the Richelieu, but one attacking plane was brought down. As for the other British Suas, they soon found themselves in a dogfight with Vichy-controlled Curtis Hawk fighters, in which two or three swordfish were brought down. Later that afternoon, another air attack saw the same thing, with two more swordfish being downed. This was bad enough, but the Curtis Hawks also made sure the British and Free French could not carry out reconnaissance flights. De Gaulle's men and his options were being shut down. Montreal's unique vibe is hard to describe, so we analyzed thousands of visitor comments to create the ultimate Montreal review. Montrealers are non-stop festivals and they dance on fun, which is a type of music in the summer. You'll get it once you're here. There is something to be said for perseverance. The question was, in this situation, who would it benefit the most to keep slugging it out? The Richelieu was hit with two 15-inch shells. Also, two Vichy subs were sunk. And as we have seen, the destroyer Lou Dassou suffered a hit. Added to this, a torpedo slammed into the HMS Resolution, and the Barnum received two battery hits. On the third day of this battle, September 25th, there were more dogfights, but the Vichy planes outfought the Allied aircraft overall. By the third day of fighting, not only did de Gaulle not possess a car, but Vichy French bombers based in North Africa raided Gibraltar. On September 24th, the day before, 50 bombers had dropped 150 bombs, though little damage was done. But the next day, the 25th, 100 Vichy bombers dropped 300 bombs. They had been going after the harbor and dockyards, but again, very few bombs struck true. This battle was widening, which de Gaulle did not need or want, so he pulled back his invasion force. The attack on Dakar was over, and it had failed. This hurt de Gaulle's standing with the Free French overall, but not his desire. He would try again, just somewhere else, two months later. In order to fully understand the next part, we have to go back to June 1940, when France fell to Germany. Philippe Pétain was chosen to lead a collaborationist government in Vichy to administer that part of France not under direct Nazi control. But wasting no time, on June 18th, de Gaulle sent out his own broadcast, calling on his fellow citizens to reject the Vichy government and join with him and the British as they continued to resist. It was this speech that set up many impassioned debates among those in the French African territories. And yet, the next military move that de Gaulle made almost didn't have to be. It irked the tall Frenchman to be reliant on the British, or anyone for that matter. But what France needed 
de Gaulle decided, was to have its own base of operations, its own lands, even if they were in Africa, with all due respect. Something, anything, to begin rebuilding French pride and honor, which would steal the French soldiers to, one day, retake their home country. And soon, de Gaulle's June 18th broadcast started paying off. On August 26th, the political and military leadership of French Chad, located due south of Libya and on the western border of British-administered Sudan, declared for de Gaulle's Free French Forces. Also on that day, on Chad's southwest border, the government of French Cameroon was seized by men loyal to de Gaulle. And two days later, August 28th, a Free French official pushed out the pro-Vichy government of French Congo, to the southeast of Cameroon, and it touches the southern borders of Chad and Sudan. This, de Gaulle's plan, was starting to work. In the end, all of the countries that made up French Equatorial Africa rallied to de Gaulle, that is, except French Gabon, along the coast, below Cameroon. But even Gabon looked promising, as the governor there, Georges Masson, stated that he vowed that Gabon would go with de Gaulle and the Free French. This was on the evening of August 28th. But the local French were not happy with this declaration, nor was the Catholic bishop Louis Tardet, who preferred Vichy France's anti-Freemason policies, and Tardet was a very popular religious leader. The governor reluctantly withdrew his declaration for the Free French. Even worse, many of the Free French sympathizers were arrested in the area. With all this shuffling around of choices and priorities, de Gaulle was on an emotional roller coaster. But Gabon's rejection hurt him the most. He had to have all of French equatorial Africa. Only this would allow him to move north and have a real impact on the wider war. If needs must, he would give battle. And now that the lines were drawn, it was time to throw up defenses. Given that Cameroon went to de Gaulle on August 27th, the officials of Gabon strengthened their frontier to their north along the Needham River. They had the standard defenses, but guessed that free French forces would soon be coming their way. And they were right. But having failed militarily before at Dakar, de Gaulle wisely went a different route. One of his officers, a Roger Gaudet, wanted to cross the Needham River, but had to have permission from the local commander there, Captain Gorves. Gaudet told Gorves that he was seriously ill and needed medical attention where Gorves was. It's possible that the latter did not believe the former, but perhaps he wanted to hear him out. Either way, Gaudet was given permission to cross, and when he did, he got right to it by telling Gorves that he needed to come over to the Free French. Fortunately, Gorves was willing to join and bring his men over. Unfortunately, he would only do this if his immediate supervisor, the chief administrator of the area, Besson, agreed and came along. When Besson was met with, he said, No. But there was something about the way he said, No, that gave Gardet hope. Still, no change of mind was forthcoming, so Gardet pulled a de Gaulle. On September 15th, Gardet stood in front of Besson and told him he, Gardet, was relieving Besson of his command. Besson, given all of his options, simply chose to leave for the pro-de Gaulle Cameroon. With the way cleared a few days later, free French forces arrived and started to spread out throughout Gabon. Their first act was to declare the pro-Gaullist Pierre Roger Martoc as the administrator. But the Vichy were not giving up just yet. Along the southern shore of Gabon sits Mayumba, vital because it's a port city. Forced to fight, Vichy Governor Georges Masson held a meeting on September 11th with his army and navy commanders, and together they decided to send troops to Mayumba as it had not yet been visited by free French forces. 
So while the Vichy troops were on their way to Mayumba, Free French Colonel André Paré, on September 15th, flew in 12 of his own men. But on that same day, the Vichy troops arrived from a ship, with more troops coming by a Vichy submarine. On board the sub were French Marines, who were expected to be the tip of the spear of the fighting that was coming. But then, French protocol got in the way. When the sub arrived, its captain, Bertrand de Saucin du pont Go was invited to breakfast with the district administrator. And during their chewing, Colonel André Paré showed up with his men that he had flown in. They walked into the residence, and what followed were stressful talks. Why? Because everybody was pointing guns. The result, however, ended up being that the submarine commander would be allowed to leave, and anyone who wanted to stay with Vichy could go with him. Much to Vichy's shame, most of the Marines opted to stay with the likely new owners of Gabon, though the majority of the country still had to be won over. With the stage set, de Gaulle arrived in Cameroon on October 8, 1940, ready to invade what parts of French Equatorial Africa had not yet come over. Again, the larger plan was to secure West and Central Africa and then push North, to help secure the southern Mediterranean coastline for the Allies. With the orders to attack given, de Gaulle went north to Chad to assess the situation there as a future jumping-off point. And it took a while to gather the forces, but on October 27th, free French forces came down from Cameroon on the east side of Spanish-controlled Equatorial Guiana, which touched Gabon's top left corner and they occupied the town of Mitzit, which is about 75 miles almost due east of the capital, Libreville. With that done, the area to the southwest was open, and the Vichy garrison commander at La Barrene, an important city to the southeast of Libreville and 50 miles from the coast, knew this. He chose not to put up resistance when the de Gaulle forces showed up on November 5th. With points north, east, and southeast of the capital taken, de Gaulle's lieutenants, General Philippe Leclerc and Battalion Chief Major Marie-Pierre Koenig, left their commander in Cameroon and started their drive for the capital, Libreville. Given the outcome of the Dakar campaign a few months earlier, the British were less than excited about supporting this endeavor. But supporting the Free French was important to Churchill, so it was important to London. Again, a certain number of ships and other vessels were produced. And the fighting seemed to be going well for the Free French, as the Vichy troops were not putting up serious resistance. As the French Foreign Legion officer John Hazy would later write, In the first few weeks, we were able to grab 150 prisoners, and many joined the Free French soon after that. Curiously enough, though, he added, no one tried to convince them. They argued it out amongst themselves and joined up voluntarily. This could easily be true, but it also sounds like self-serving propaganda for de Gaulle. Things were going well on land, and three days later, November 8th, the British sloop HMS Milford found the Vichy submarine Poncelet following the Anglo-French task force. The Poncelet had escorted the ships and had dropped off men earlier when Vichy forces were trying to save Mayumba. As the British sloop had been built in 1932, she was not fast enough to keep up with a French sub. But Admiral John Cunningham, who had been given a command in the Mediterranean fleet and had been a part of the unsuccessful Operation Menace back in September to take Dakar in Senegal, ordered his flagship HMS Devonshire to send off its supermarine walrus biplane. The plane found the sub and dropped two salvos of 100 pounds, or 45 kilogram depth charges, which caused some damage. Admiral Cunningham was hoping the attack would cause the sub to slow down enough so his flagship Devonshire could catch up and sink it. But the plane's crew did better than expected. 
Still, the sub was active, and it made its way closer towards the sloop. At 5.20 p.m., the Milford radioed that it was engaged by the enemy sub. The Poncelle fired a torpedo, but it went under the sloop. Its captain, Bertrand de Sosin Dupont de Gaulle, ordered a second torpedo, but something went wrong. It got stuck in the tube, and then it cracked a leak, and a horrible smell started coming out from the damage. Sosin had the sub surface and ordered his crew to abandon ship. Seeing an opportunity, Admiral John Cunningham ordered the British light cruiser HMS Delhi to catch up to the sub and put one of its own crew on her. They were to assess the damage and, if possible, take the sub back to safer waters, at the very least, to keep it out of Vichy hands. But Sosen had other ideas. The British came upon the surfaced sub, but once all of the crew were off, except the captain, he took her down again for the last time. Opening her seacocks, the Poncelet would never have her honor impugned. She went down about 55 miles southwest of Lieberville. The Milford was ordered to pick up the survivors. The sub Poncelet has yet to be found. Also on November 8th, Free French commander Major Pierre Koenig landed with his troops just south of the capital, which was their target. The next day, Free French Lysander planes bombed Libreville's airfield. After this, Koenig's men, French legionnaires, Senegalese, and Cameroonian troops moved forward, but only to be stymied several times. Still, they would not quit. The airfield was soon taken. Meanwhile, Free French warships exchanged shells with the coastal guns. Between the intense land battles, the bombardment from sea and air, Liberville was taken on November 10th. Two days later, November 12th, another important city, Port Gentile, surrendered. The governor, Georges Masson, killed himself rather than face his failures. The battle for Gabon was over. Fortunately, the death toll was not as large as other operations would be. Unfortunately, de Gaulle's speech sent through the area did not impress or persuade many captured Vichy soldiers to fight on his side. Thus, they stayed prisoners for the rest of the war. Churchill focused on de Gaulle's victories, while FDR grumped about de Gaulle's failures. Both men had plenty to write about. But at least the majority of French colonial territory was with the Free French now. Not that de Gaulle still did not have lands to conquer, but his would be a methodical success story. Say, versus the speed of a Caesar. Some people might say coffee doesn't need chocolate, but you're not some people. You're a dreamer. You see the possibilities of chocolate and caramel flavors swirling together with cold brew, topped with velvety chocolate cold foam and cocoa caramel crumbles. That imagination can only be rewarded with Dunkin's new caramel chocolate cold brew. It's a cold brew dream come true. America runs on Dunkin'. Price and participation may vary. Limited time offer. Terms apply. 